Um, we were thinking about um, simply presenting you um, individual setup. I'm a composer and a singer for, for many years now, and I've been working in the improvisation scene for many years as a vocalist, and for one year I'm working with the, the two We remotes and um, software by made and um, developed by Stein. And within compositions, I use uh, pre-recorded -re pre material samples of my own pieces, more or less. And here within a more um, improv kind of um, context, I play with myself, more or less. And the computer gives me the possibility to sort of have a dialogue with myself. And I demonstrate that shortly for you. And um, um, now maybe Jamie is presenting uh, sure. what she's doing. So I work uh, with video primarily, but uh, also I'm using interactive software, so I'm actually intersecting with music uh, and dance, work with uh, theater, dance, opera. Um, uh, I started using the Wii controller as well for playing around with visuals, controlling visuals. And uh, Alex and I worked together last February for the first time. We only had two days to work together. So we put on a piece, and uh, we come back here now for two weeks to develop um, the integration of our softwares and our performance styles, and to discover where video and sound can really, really merge as much as possible. So we've only been here two days together. We've merged quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to show you a couple other things before we start with our demo, because uh, some of the other work that I do is um, creating experimental performance visual uh, hardware as well as software. So this is a movie video spotlight that I've designed that's run from uh, Isadora software, which is similar to Max MSP, uh, with a moving mirror, and so it's an interactive video spotlight. So at some point we hope to integrate this moving video spotlight into what we're doing, uh, as well as uh, I've also uh, come up with a Gorilla um, affordable 3D video projection. So you can actually have the image floating, you know, coming forward from the screen, floating in the air uh, above the performance, behind the performance, and so on as well. So those more advanced projection techniques are something that we're going to get to you know, at some point later on in our process together. But uh, right now, uh, uh, I'm not going to show you too much of the video because we're going to give you a demo anyway. Um, as far as the software goes, I'm using, um, I'm not using Junction, although I'm using something very similar to Junction called Osculator to listen to the Bluetooth controllers. 
and that's talking to Mesodora software. Uh, for those of you that aren't really familiar with it, you can just think of it as very similar to Max, um, but very good at handling video. And uh, we're, we're connected with sound, and uh, also we're connected, uh, his junction um, information is coming into my Isadora as well. So uh, we just keep making more and more connections between us, which gives us more and more uh, possibilities for um, controlling both the imagery and the sounds is a, in a sort of duo. Two, two stops. Just, uh,
set up for that. It's just uh, we didn't really have any time yet to uh, tune some lighting and to... Uh, like one of the things that we'll also be doing is just uh, hand control. So you can just right control, control the video with, with your hands. Um, so that'll be the next step to integrate yeah. Yeah. movement as well as being um, a trigger level for Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it can also okay. include the live image in the imagery as well. So either you just use the digital camera for tracking and for triggering, or for a live video feed, or for both. That's, that's what's <coughs> so yeah, lights, live video, pre-recorded video. Um, and I, I do shoot all my own material for, for the film footage. It's all original. So, so. Mm -hmm. None of that. It's all created for each project specifically. But because we've just started, we're not sure yet. We're, we have to conceptualize the imagery uh, to create something specifically just for this project. Okay. The, the music you use, the pre-composed pre music, uh, did you already, uh, before you were starting, did you already have an order, or did you uh, choose it uh, through, uh, while you were doing it? Um, actually, the way because you don't you can't look at your screen, so you can only use your. Oh well, it's, I have three buttons for three different uh, uh, sample zones. Let's call it, and I know meanwhile, you know, yeah. once you reverse the lock, that you know where where to um, press uh, buttons. Right? Okay. 
So I, what I used was, was this sound, I think. Now the question is, what was this? Is it quiz? Any idea? So that's the, um, a tuning. This is, this is a piece I wrote for timpani, you know, large large drum timpani for the orchestra, and tuning forks. Um, okay. So so you uh, you hit the tuning fork and then press it on the on 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 the, on the surface of uh, the timpani, and then it makes this bunk, you know, this this this, this hitting uh, sound, right? But uh, the, the, the vibration of the tuning fork is uh, sustained by the timpani. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next one. Right. It's my first thing back for, um, and I, I teach um, in the music department in the University of Newcastle, uh, upon time in the very north of England, right from the, the sort of almost we're almost Scottish, but not quite. Um, <laughs> What I want to talk to you about today, I've, I've, I've been here for just, just a week now, and I'm, I'm picking up on an idea that I first had when I was doing the orientation week at this time, about two years, in fact, almost exactly two years ago. Um, and so mostly I'm going to talk to you because the thing is not really working yet. I can give you a couple of very simple demos, but I can't do a, a, a great virtual sort of performance like Alex and, and, and Jamie just did, which is beautiful. Um, so I'll, I'm just going to mostly talk about this thing. When I was here doing uh, the, the orientation week at Stein, where you learn about, the, if you don't know about it, you learn about the software and things that they're developing here. Um, Daniel Shono said to me that they designed an ultrasound system for uh, Frances Marie Uiti, the cellist. And that when she, um, when they tried to put ultrasound sensors onto the cello bowl, they affected the way it so much that she, she she didn't enjoy it. They had to find a solution to so it didn't interfere with with her playing. And she's a, a real virtuoso cellist. Um, and I sort of thought, well, what about if if making the instrument harder to play was actually the whole point? Now, I'm not a violinist like Francis Marie Uiti is a cellist. I am a violin owner rather than a violinist. Yeah. I have a violin, and I mostly play Irish and Scottish folk music on it. I don't play, I'm not a classically trained violinist. But I've been using the violin in free improv quite a lot because of the kinds of, I'm classically a piano player. And because the violin has, um, more than the piano, I think, pianists in the audience disagree with me, but more than the piano, the violin is a very direct physical contact between your imagination and your body um, and the sound it makes. So you can be very gestural with a violin the way that you can't, maybe with a piano, or, or in a different way. It's not so. The piano doesn't have the range of sounds. And so I've developed a relationship to the violin that I use it as a sort of sound box, sound object. Um, and in some of my, my academic work, some of my theory, cultural theory writing, I started to think that the violin was almost like um, like a sensor for what goes on inside of your body, in your emotions, in your physical. So, you know, if, you, if you're feeling very tense, you know, you, your body moves in a certain way. If you're feeling very relaxed, you know, you can do beautiful, long kind of sounds. You could be very violent and sort of, you know, throw yourself around on it. And the violin becomes almost like a kind of a, uh, it's like, you know, sonification, you know, where you have a, a computer can turn physical data into sound. Maybe a violin, particularly if you can't play it properly, um, maybe it's like a kind of sonification device, yeah? And so I was having all these ideas, and I thought, well, what if, what if we put these two things together and Instead of trying to find a, a system, an interface that makes the violin um, interface with the computer in a way that um, means I can still play it normally, what if I go in the other direction? 
And I start to develop an instrument that it's, it's actually quite hard to do what I normally do on it. What if there's a sense that actually the violin is fighting back, is resisting being played? And obviously putting um, ultrasound sensors just on a violin board, it's enough weight to make it actually quite difficult to play normally straight off, as Francis Marie discovered. I then, I remember when I was here, I talked to Daniel, I actually, and I've got it here, because I, I keep a, a log of every studio project I do, because I'm a bit, I'm just a bit like that. You know? um, and I remember drawing this picture of what a resistant violin might look like. And it's a violin where it's actually the ball and the instrument are connected together with elastic bands originally, you know, sort of tiny elastic bands. But that, originally, I also had the idea that it would be suspended like an object floating in space. And what would happen is in a gallery, people would walk by and they'd touch it. It would start to swing. And the elastic bands would, and the ball would move very, very small amounts and make a sort of little, sounds like, maybe almost inaudible, small sounds that it could make. And I thought, well, instead of it being an installation piece, what if it was actually a performance piece? And what if it was a violin that I had to physically struggle with to try and produce sound? And that in the process of struggling with it, all of these elastic bands were driving sensors that would be generating computer data that could be used um, to process these little creaks and scratches. And I am... Um, I got very excited when, when Daniel showed us one of these, these. I've got four of these sensors on here now, and I'll show you the, the, the thing. Um, just, uh, they're these. Oh shit. <laughs> they're these tiny little um, motion sensors, which are they're, they're like a, a, a pin that runs through this black plastic box, and they can move. Almost like a piston, yeah? These, if you're careful, you can have a look at it. Uh, just take care of this as well. It's in a very fragile state and it's worth <laughs> tens of thousands of pounds. <laughs> so these, you, can, you can try just moving the ball and you'll see it moves these little piston sensors. There's two on the top and two on the bottom. And they, they just generate 0 to 127. They just generate a, a um, through, through junction. They just do a, a full range of MIDI. Like continuous controls, yeah. Resistance or pressure? Um, I'm not, it's, 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 it must be resistance because it's not pressure inside, isn't it? Do you know how they work? It's resistance. It is resistance. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. They just, you know, just little, it doesn't move very far. But it's like a or Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, when Atar Tanaka used a similar principle, he used potentiometers with springs on them for the, the big, um, not web, the big um, the sound net thing. Sound yeah. thing. So, what I've now got is, is a violin that sort of it resists being played really quite physically because we've got two of these sensors on the top and two on the bottom connected by strong elastic bands. And then, originally I planned there was going to be maybe 16 of these sensors. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all the way up the board until I discovered they actually cost 45 euros each. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of, you know, I'm not mean, but it's just art, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of my own money on that. So, we, we've, um, uh, Jürgen, uh, who builds, helps really to build the instruments here, um, he and I, and, and John as well, one of my friends here from Newcastle, we've been trying to find ways to get similar effect, a similar kind of data, without having to, you know, me having to take a second job. And we came up with, with two really quite interesting ideas. One of which is to just use uh, a, normal, a normal bend sensor, like they're using gloves, you know, sort of mini gloves, mm -hmm. and just connect it to a spring at either end. So it's normally, when, it, when the ball's fully relaxed, it's, it's at its uh, slack, its demand, as the ball is drawn back eventually. You can bring it back to stretch, yeah? And of course, 
All these different sensors are all at slightly different tensions, and they're creating a very unstable cloud of, um, of data. The most unstable one, though, that we came up with, which is, uh, unfortunately, I can't actually get it to work yet with the MaxPatch, but it is generating the data, is this tiny little, electro, uh, little chip here, a little hole sensor, you know, which moves in a magnetic field and, and, and uh, changes voltage. And what we've done is we've got this hole sensor attached to uh, two ends of a piece of elastic. So it, it, doesn't, it actually takes quite a while to move. And it actually doesn't move all that far when it does move compared to the other sensors, yeah? And all we've got is, a, is a, a magnet out of a dead hard disk, really strong magnet, generating sort of a little um, sort of half sphere magnetic field. So as the, again, if you want to afterwards, you can come up, because we couldn't find a thing to project my uh, computer onto the screen. Um, I forgot my, um, my little interface thing. But as it moves across, it doesn't just, the, the sensing is not just side to side, but it also senses in that direction, it gets different data, and also the distance from the magnet. So as I, so as I particularly if I'm you know, doing something quite, um, sort of convulsive stuff, this thing is just generating really, really fast streams and streams of data. It's almost as if it was like a random node generator, but of course it's not random. It's got linearity built into it. It's like little fragments of lines into it. So musically, it's quite potentially quite interesting um, uh, control information. Um, so really, and then I've got a couple of contact mics um, underneath it. Uh, just under the bridge. I've also got it set up so I, I, I usually just play into a pair of good quality Neumann microphones when I'm, when I'm doing improv because it pick, pick, they pick up all of the little scratchy, um, you know, the, the sort of dirt of the violin. They don't just pick up the, the pure tone of the instrument. Um, what I've got here somewhere. Um, <laughs> Basically, it's got a little, um, a little demo here. This is just really basic stuff. Just make sure it's all right. Come on. Yeah. Um, this would just be a. Um, it's a very very simple uh, ring modulation patch. Thing about it is the slightest movement you make on it, it sort of does something. And basically, I've got four of the sensors are just controlling very simple cycle objects in that, so just generating sign waves, which I'm then um, multiplying with the sounds the violin makes. So, a lot of the time, it's very to sort of, the, almost the violin to decide when does it sample. This is all about 
taking the, the, the expressivity and the intention and the, the ego out of doing free improv and to almost let the, I have to work with what it gives me rather than only making the sound myself. Um, and, but actually one, one of the things I'd really like to be able to do is, is for the violin to decide what gets sampled, what doesn't. But I haven't programmed that yet. So while, just for working, i just got the extra switch to switch on um, some recording. And it should just play. It doesn't because I forgot to switch on the digital analog converter, which is. fairly poor sound quality because it's just these two little cheap contact mics but the idea again is to eventually use these to be driving the, the strong pitched material if you like and then having a, um, an air microphone as well to pick up all of the, all of the little bone and sort of dirt and that, that sort of characteristic of the, of the violin. So that's really all it is. It's, it's a violin that's even harder to play than a normal violin. <laughs> Um, but it, once, once uh, I sort of develop it past this, the very difficulties, the things that make it difficult, will also be the things that actually generate the real music, that generate the, the in a sense, the artistic content will come out of the difficulties. So, um, that's it. Any, any, any questions? <laughs> Subconsciously, at least, from a sort of my own um, my own anxieties about the very idea of free improvisation, and, and a lot of the a lot of the politics that goes with free improvisation, I find really suspect. I find it really problematic. Um, this idea that somehow it's a natural thing to do, it's something oh we we just do it. And that's that's bullshit. We don't just do anything. Everything we do. Is because we're part of a social group, because we're part of a culture, because we've learned. To, we even you know, different cultures breathe differently. You know, they use different muscles to breathe normally. You know, uh, breathing, eating, everything that we think of as natural is, is really cultural. You know, it's all learned behaviour. Um, and so the idea that free improvisation somehow touches some, you know, biological universal musical language, I think is, politically, that's fascist. Uh, I have a real problem with that. Um, well, no, because it presupposes that everybody is the same. In other words, everybody's like me. That's what that message usually gives out, you know, uh, all, all human beings. Of course, the problem with negating that message is that, well, then you also legitimate, I'm better than people who are not the same as me. That's a philosophical um, non sequitur, actually. It's possible to accept that everybody is different, 
without then putting yourself in the position of superiority with respect to them. It's what I think of as normal democratic behavior. But again, that's a cultural thing. Um, so there's a kind of wanting to critique that idea that I just naturally play the violin by putting, by making it obvious that the violin is an obstacle to that kind of thing. That, that culture actually gets a hold of the things that we think of are natural and, and molds them. And actually often does violence to them. Um, but again, we can't live without those kind of acts of violence uh, against eating animals, for example. And not everyone is a vegetarian. The other side is um, I got sort of I got sort of really tired of hearing the idea that somehow digital technologies make music uh, easy. <laughs> anyone can make music with digital technologies. Well, anyone can make music with a piano. Anyone can make music with their voice. You know, what's the big deal here? Uh, and I just wanted to sort of hold up a mirror, if you like, to that idea and sort of say, well, actually, I can use digital technologies to make it's really difficult to make music too. <laughs> actually, you know, and actually that's I mean that's a joke on the one hand. But also it is actually to, to, to do something um, with with a, a sort of hand me down software with a with a factory made software. To actually do something original actually does take a great deal of hard work and imagination. If you just take, you know, the latest version of Cubase with all its preset sounds, that's very difficult to actually well it's as difficult as making any kind of music to make something interesting. In other words, the fact that it's digital doesn't make it easy. It makes it easy to reproduce things. It doesn't make it easy to make things in the first place. That's the question. Yeah. Um, I think you use it to improve your normal thing. Sorry? Can you use it to improve your normal thing? Well, I think anything would improve. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's already improved. Um, what this, what, in terms of, I mean, in terms of, of how it might develop as a project, this this difficulty and the, the obstruction and the resistance is only one of the ideas I have with it. One of the other possibilities would be to try, I mean, and it's very simple, simply use less strong elastic stuff that's got more um, more give in it. Or to use, you can get these um, tension, elastic tension sensors where the material itself generates the signal, and it's much easier to work with. And actually, one of the other ideas I have is to try and use it to adapt the normal violin gestures that I would use, you know, the straight R chord and spiccato, uh, and the different um, techniques that you have of playing, to actually make a kind of a, um, a kind of controller device. That would then be able to inter, inter, interact with sort of more sort of acousmatic, music concrete kind of sound worlds or pre-recorded sounds, but play in a sort of violinistic, violinistic way. But I'm not, I, my my programming is not up to that yet. But that's one of the other things I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's not all just negation, negation, negation. It's, it's and also this, this actually, it's actually kind of quite fun to play. Um, it, it, it actually don't, you do feel as if you're you, you're interacting with it. It really is pulling against um, and forcing you to think creatively in a different way. Okay, I think. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. researcher working in the DJ culture and turn um, so, so as a DJ, I'm really interested in the move from um, or the move to to gain tactile control over digital audio. I'm also interested in current technologies and also technologies that have been being developed in the DJ field. So for this past week residency at Stein I've been researching various software DJ programs, researching this that's tax turntable here, which, it, which allows you to allows you to, to be controlled by a computer. It's got a MIDI input on it, but also it's got some really other nice features like this ultra pitch share, so you can take it really fast or really slow. And it's also got a reverse function and it's really nice break adjust, so you can actually determine how the record will stop. So it, that's just something else we really play with. So I have a lot of fun with that, and also just exploring some of the, the other DJ controllers that they have here. 
So this setup that I have at the minute is a, um, it's a digital vinyl setup. So I have a, a computer. I have a hybrid DJ mixer, which in, it works both as a, a regular audio mixer and the MIDI controller, so via Firewire, so I can actually get in and do stuff on the computer as well. But also, time code vinyl here. Yeah. I'll just give you um, some example. <laughs> Okay, so digital vinyl systems are nothing new, really. Been was developed in the late 90s by Stanton and produced a, many of you probably heard of it, if there's any dangers in the room now. Produced a system called Final Scratch um, in, in, in collaboration with Richie Horton and John Aquaviva, who are pioneers of, well, Detroit Techno, second wave after Jeff Mills. Um, yes? <laughs> okay, so but there are other systems um, on the market now. And um, Rain do a, a similar system to Final Strike for Surat, and also Native Instruments are doing a, a system called Tractor Scratch now. Um, but the system I'm using is called Miss Pingy. Um, it's it's not as well known, and it's a lot. It's not as, as expensive as the as the other commercial applications. So I'll just kind of explain what is happening with the time code. So as, so as the needle's tracing the groove, the software's listening to the speed and also the direction and also the position of the stylus on the vinyl. So, so what's happening there is the speed is obviously determining how fast the, the audio file plays back and the direction, whether well, it's playing in forwards or reverse, and also the position sets the location within the digital audio file in the computer. Okay. So the time code signal. Let's play it again. Just like that. It's comprised of two parts, so that you have a test tone, which is a fixed frequency that runs all the way through the binary. And pitch change in there so the computer is looking for changes in pitch. But also there's a position stamp which I guess is a lot of that kind of data beyond the, the fixed frequency. So okay so so how does it actually work out? So we know that's how it works out the pitch. How, how does it actually work out the, the direction that it's playing? So it does that. It does it by a process called stereo phase shift, where you take the time coded vinyl is is cut as a stereo wave file, so left and right channel. And the way they do it is they set them out of sync by just a tiny fraction, so that when the record is played forward, the right channel is just a, a tiny bit ahead of the left, and when it's played backwards, the right channel is a little bit behind. If you know, if you know what I mean. So it uses that relationship to determine forwards and backwards. And also, the the position sound is just simply a case of I say simple is quite quite complex. They have 155 unique position points per revolution of the record. So so it allows you to kind of jump through. Residency, I've been building something equivalent to a DJ battle tune, which um, you get a lot in kind of hip hop culture where you get a record press with a lot of individual samples on them that you can then use in performance. So I've been making a metaphorical vinyl, so I've been just digitizing um, just some seven inches, also ripping sounds from, from CD, and also using samples um, from recordings that were made in the recording studio. I'm just really trying to. I've got about seven different builds of this of this actual vinyl at the minute, just so that hopefully I'll get to a stage where 
this can be my instrument. I can learn where the sounds are on the vinyl and just kind of mix between them and then also take this solo setup into a, into a collaborative um, setup as well. Okay, so that's basically what I've been doing for the past week. So I'd like to just give you a quick kind of three to five minute demonstration of what I'm actually doing. sync with the vinyl and what I'm doing it was actually out of sync that which is really annoying. Um, so that's just kind of to make up the fact that it was a good performance. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I don't know the system but um, what is actually um, uh, analyzing the 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 music, the, uh, uh, the, the, the dump that are on the time time for? Yeah, it's what kind of program is it? It's um the program is Pingy is built within Max MSP, so there's an object in there that's looking for it's doing pitch analysis um, or velocity as they call it, um, and also yeah forwards, backwards, and also the position stem. So yeah, it's just an object built within Max MSP. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's actually listening to the audio. It's not being transmitted by the USB or FireWire? Because no, no, it's FireWire. Um, it's, this mixer has got a built-in audio interface, so it is going through FireWire to the computer, but it's actually, it's also got a built-in preamp as well, so the signal is coming straight out of the turntable via phono cable, straight into the mixer, being amplified and sent to the computer. Yeah, okay. So if you, if you, if you record the, the, the signal from the uh, vinyl directly to an ordinary tape, for instance, and then you can actually still uh, analyze it with X. But it's an analog signal. Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, okay. okay. Yes? So the, the, the turntable on the right there, what is actually the disc that's, the record that's on there? Is it 
This is a vinyl that you get with the Miss Pinky software. It's just um, right. It just has the, the time code. It just has the time code. Yeah. yeah both okay. both turntables do so. Oh, both. Okay. So it's all. I, I was I wasn't quite sure if the turntable on this side is actually a real. Yeah, yeah. Record. It's, it's a full digital vinyl. System. Okay. Yeah. Just this turntable is a is a Vastax, and it's got right. a lot more functionality than the standard Technics, which is still beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, I, I think all this DJ and um, turntable stuff is at a real transition phase right now where we're all struggling dealing with different software, different technology. Like the mixer you have of a hybrid with both audio interface built in and working as a MIDI controller and audio yeah. is something that everybody's been waiting for, oh. it seems like. And also the this digital vinyl encoding stuff is also sort of an awkward kind of technology that we might laugh at in 50 years when we look back. But my question is, you know, if you had an ideal equipment, ideal setup, like what would be sort of your ideal turntable interface or mixer or like, yeah. Yeah, um, well I guess it would, it would still have to be based on, on actual vinyl, just for, just for the tactility, just for the hands-on feel of it. But I guess, um, yeah, just just mention I mentioned briefly before I um, tried to scratch. They've actually brought out a, a higher resolution time code now, which is meant to be like real vinyl. Which I'm, I'm sure they said that about the first one as well. But um, I guess yeah, it would, it would still be vinyl on a on a record with a, with a needle. Um, if that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm loving this this hybrid mixer as well because it's with a built-in interface as well. It's audio interface. It's it's really easy to root stuff as well, so it's, it's, but it was expensive, but I'll just not eat for a couple of months, you know. <laughs> what is that mix of? Um, it's made by Korg, um, which is quite big, well, yeah, you, you know how to the keyboards. So, um, yeah, it's just a, each, each channel can be either just a, a regular line in, phono line in, or a mic in, or and such a MIDI mode, it goes green, so all these then become mappable. So it's really mm -hmm. quite flexible and true. And also it has a building um, sampler, which was using their master effects. So it's quite uh, a um, What's the main difference between this and Final Scratch? Um, I guess there's not much difference really. They're just both based on a, on a time code vinyl con controlling um, digital audio files. So I haven't looked at when I looked at the software. So it's about four or five years ago now. So I haven't looked at it since. Um, so I can't see how, how can't say how they might have improved it. But it's still based on yeah. Um, I haven't uh, had a look at the new uh, final, but I guess you, you see differences uh, from one track to another. Or is it just one big track that you can on the way The way I've done it is um, I've just got a, a loop, a sample that I've looped within the software, so I'll just continuously play it. Um, and on this one, this is more kind of like a, like a regular battle vinyl with lots of sounds on, and I can kind of interject over this. And so, really, I, I just I wanted something here so that, that I could set in motion as a solo. Just to do solo sets or kind of drop things in, you know. So you don't have to remember where or exactly on what spot on the vinyl that sample starts. You, you do sometimes, um, but like I say, um, in the performance there, I just had something looping, looping away. But if you, I don't know if you can see on the, on the vinyl, they've actually put these, these sections where. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can see. So you can get, you can kind of get an understanding of where the samples are. Yeah. But that's hopefully that's what I wanted to try and achieve eventually is just have this this DJ tool that I can then kind of flick through and learn and use as an instrument. Yeah. yeah. So you so you remember well. I, I think the section of the ten minutes that sample and starts. So yeah. So yeah. 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 